morning. Remain standing, please. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessings on our service today, and we're so glad you're here. We have a number of people who cannot be here today. We need to pray for these people. Roger Bradley was taken to the hospital uh, Friday or Saturday. Kathy Alvarez is in the hospital. Art Tear is in the hospital. A number of other people are sick, so let's pray for them. And then also continue to pray for Mrs. Dennis, who is here this morning. Her husband passed away this week. The funeral service is to be on Friday right here, the Lord willing, at 11 o'clock with a viewing at 10. So uh, plan to come if you possibly can. She would be honored by that. Let's bow our heads and our hearts together, please. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the privilege of meeting here together today. We ask you to bless every aspect of this service. Bless the music. Bless the testimonies. Bless the message to our hearts. Father, use this service to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, uplift his name, and Father, if there are those that are not saved yet, they would hear the gospel and respond today. We pray for these who are sick that we've mentioned, others whom we have not mentioned. We ask you to work in each life according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It is a joy to welcome you this morning. I've already had had the privilege of meeting some first-time guests who came all the way from Georgia to hear me preach. Isn't that amazing? You didn't know I was so well-known. I didn't know that either. Uh, This is family of the Knowles, and they're visiting from Georgia. Are all of you from Georgia, the whole line? No. And Florida. All right. Georgia and Florida. So they're from down there coming up here to the beautiful weather in Delaware. Any other first-time guests today? We want to make sure you get a welcome packet. Any other first-time guests? We want to make sure if you haven't had a welcome packet, we want you to have one. And if you get one, take time, please, to fill it out and drop it in the offering plate as you leave today. Let's continue our singing, please. Number 474. 474.
And verse number four, please. Are ye troubled at the thought of dying? Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. For Christ coming, kingdom are you sighing? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus, tell it to Jesus. He is a friend that's well known. One more time, let the instruments drop out, please. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, O oh, my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King. much. Our missions conference begins in September. We have five Sundays of a missions conference, and four of them will have missionaries. But kind of as an uh, introduction to the missionary conference or a preview of the missions conference, we have a guest missionaries today. I'm going to ask Brother Ezekiel, Brother Zeke, Ezekiel, you go by Zeke, Zeke Jezik to come to the platform, please. Give a word of testimony. He and his wife will be ministering to us tonight. He'll be preaching tonight, presenting his field, giving his testimony. That's a wonderful testimony. Missionary going to Vietnam undercover. Here he is. Good morning, church. Morning. Um, so, Pastor asked me to come and share a little, bit, a little bit about my testimony, but he also said they want you to come back tonight, so I'm not going to say it a lot. Uh, of the, our testimony, but so I was born and raised in a country in Southeast Asia and in my home country. I lived there and grew up there, and I lost both of my parents. Uh, I became an orphan uh, when I was young. So the government took me and put me in an orphanage in um, a really big city in, inside that country. And so they got, got used American family, adopted me, brought me to the United States, as I learned and struggle English, English is really hard, by the way. Um, but uh, so as I grow and grow more and, and know about God, I got saved. I got trained in, in a BBC in Springfield, Missouri. And now we are sending back to go back to Vietnam uh, to reach my people uh, for the Lord. So, but my, this is my wife, Sadie. Yeah, so we've been married for five years, so please pray for her. Uh, uh, we, we, not only because of me, but also because of the language she's going to learn in, in, over, in Southeast Asia. So please come back. Come back by our table. Grab some coffee candy if you get tired tonight. Uh, we got cappuccino and straight black coffee candy and also prayer card. So please come by and talk to us if you have any questions. And, and we'd love to be here. And we love you guys. So please come back tonight. Thank you. Guys. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, coffee candy and cappuccino candy. Sounds pretty interesting to me. I'm going to come back tonight. We found out that his wife also, I believe, is a musician, is going to play the piano for us. So, Sadie, why don't you move to the piano and play for us? And Lord willing, tonight, uh, they'll be in our services and sharing much, much more tonight.
Thank you, Sadie. What a blessing. Uh, she's scheduled to do some music tonight, too. All right. They'll be doing music tonight as well. A couple of announcements. Uh, we start our Awana program the first Wednesday night of September. Awana is a special club, very, very exciting for young people. It's on Wednesday nights beginning at 630. If you're interested in serving as a worker in Awana Club, we have a meeting on Wednesday night, August 31st, that will uh, help you become involved. You would need to be a member of our church. We need to be properly screened. See Brother Dan Smith regarding that. Those of you who have children <clears throat> up to the age of sixth grade, uh, the Awana program is a wonderful, wonderful time for them. And it allows you to come into our adult Bible study, which goes on from 7 till 8 on Wednesday also. Lord willing, on September 11th, we plan to observe the Lord's Supper. And then beginning on the 18th, our missions conference will be five Sundays this, uh, this time. Five Sundays, and we'll be telling you more about that, giving you information about a ladies' lunch, men's breakfast. We'll just have a wonderful, wonderful time. Our choir is going to sing for you at this time, Beautiful Savior.
Thank you, choir. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Revelation, the book of Revelation, Revelation, chapter 19, the final book in the Bible. Revelation, close to the final chapters of the Bible. Revelation, chapter 19. I want to read for you this morning our text down in verses 1 through 9. 1 through 9. So we'd like you to follow along Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, and I'm reading through verse 9. If you're able, would you stand, please, while we read the Word of God, then remain standing for our next congregational song. Revelation chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, says this, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent, omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. Remain standing now, please. Take a songbook and turn to number 464. We'll continue our singing with No, Not One. As we dismiss the children, those who are going to Children's Church, you can be dismissed while we're singing number 464. There's not a friend like the Lord. We're going to hear now from Dave Morgan.
program won't open. Can't get it. Can't get it. How many? How many enjoyed seeing Brother Dave up there? <laughs> the Bible says that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, and I think that means electronics and sound waves. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I think that may had to do with it. And he's losing some of his help. They're leaving for college this week, so we're going to be in trouble. We're not. Question, how many of you enjoy going to a wedding? All the ladies raised their hand, a few of the men. Isn't it exciting? At most weddings, there's special music, special decorations, special dresses on the bride and the bridesmaids. Uh, the groom and the groomsmen wear fancy clothes, flowers, and other decorations all around. It's just a wonderful, exciting event. Very, ex very special occasions for men and women, the bride and groom. I can remember a lot of weddings, um, several special weddings. I can remember my own wedding. How many think I have a good memory to remember that wedding a long time ago? Um, sort of a blur, here's what I remember. I was told what to wear. I was told where to stand. I was told what to say. I was even told when I could kiss my wife. I just was a spectator at my own wedding, I think. Weddings are exciting. I can remember the wedding of our daughter, Miriam. Many of you have met Miriam. She's been here a number of times. I can remember the, the weddings of my other kids, too, but, but Miriam's was the one we had to pay for, so I remember it a lot better. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I remember having to give her away, walking down the aisle, giving her away. Every one of you dads, you understand, that's not a very pleasant thought. You want to give her away, and you want to tell that guy, now listen, buddy, <laughs> you take care of my little girl. I remember a wedding that took place years ago. My wife and I, this was years ago, were going to sing in the wedding. And somehow or other, to my knowledge, it's the only time it's ever happened at a wedding, somehow or other, we had the wrong time. We were to sing right as the wedding began. We got there, and all the cars were there. We thought we were a little bit early, and it was very quiet outside. We got in there, and it was quiet inside, because they were waiting for us. We weren't late to our own wedding, but we were way too late to that wedding. I remember Saturday years ago, before we came here, when my wife and I attended three weddings on the same Saturday. And the receptions were called breakfast, lunch, and dinner, in my mind. I don't know how that figured. And I remember the weddings of some of you who've uh, given me the privilege of participating in your weddings. Weddings are beautiful events. But no matter how many weddings you've attended, no matter how nice a wedding you've attended, how many watched years ago the wedding of Prince Charles and Princess Diana? The whole world watched that years ago if you're old enough. The fancy weddings, no matter how many weddings you've attended, or no matter how fancy they were, you ain't seen nothing yet. There's a wedding, you look in Revelation 19. This is where we're going today. This is called the marriage of the Lamb, Revelation 19. This wedding, this marriage will surpass anything you have ever seen, anything you've ever imagined regarding a wedding. I want to share with you some thoughts about that today. I'm back in Revelation 19. We just read it, but I'm going to read again. Verses 7 through 9, knowing that we're talking about, we're featuring the marriage of the Lamb. 
Verse 7, Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. This will be a celebration in heaven like we have never seen on earth. You know, perhaps, if you've read the Bible much, that the Bible uh, uses marriage to illustrate uh, God's relationship to his people. If you'll turn with me to some of these scriptures quickly, or at least listen, in Isaiah chapter 4, we see this. Isaiah chapter 4, God is using marriage to illustrate his relationship with the nation of Israel, his special nation. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, oh, by the way, the missionaries didn't leave because they didn't want to hear me preach. The missionaries left because they're ministering in children's church. I thought I'd better tell you that. They did want to hear me preach. I'm going to make them watch the video. (laughs) No, I'm not. Isaiah chapter 4, Isaiah chapter 4. The Bible says this in verse 5, For thy maker is thine husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. The God of the whole earth shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit, and a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. He's using marriage as a uh, symbol or an illustration of his relationship to his people. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in the New Testament. We see a similar situation where marriage is used to show a relationship between God and people. Here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul was writing to the Corinthian church, and he wrote the letter. He had started the church. He loved these people. He tells them how much he loved these people, and he said, "Uh, I feel like a father giving you away to a new husband. Listen to what he says in verse 2 of 2 Corinthians 11. For I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. One more illustration. I'd like you to see this one, Ephesians chapter 5. Many of you are familiar with this. In fact, it talks about the husband and wife, and it gives good instruction to husbands and good instruction to wives. Watch this in Ephesians chapter 5. It talks about your role as a husband, your role as a wife. If you read no other scripture about being a husband or a wife, Ephesians 5 is the place you want to start. But listen to what he says in Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church." For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. You can hear so much that can be taught and explained through here. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to show you that he is using this as a comparison. Look now at the next verse, verse 32. This, he says, about all that he said, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. God is dealing with the Lord Jesus Christ's relationship with his church. This is pretty clear in the Bible. Now, for us to understand the marriage of the Lamb, there are two or three things we need to understand about a Jewish wedding back in this time. I'll give you thoughts about the Jewish wedding, then I'll show you how they compare with the marriage of the Lamb. Consider the stages of a Jewish marriage. It was usually in three stages. Some call it two and combine the second two. I'm going to call it three and help you understand this. The first stage was called the betrothal or betrothal period. This was the period of preparation. 
Both sets of parents would make a contract for the marriage of the children. The contract would normally not involve the children having a choice at all. The parents would think, this guy is going to make a good husband for my girl, or this girl is going to make a good wife for my husband. They would enter into this contract, and those two kids were betrothed. In fact, sometimes it happened before they were even teenagers. Our missionaries tell us that in some countries, they still have somewhat of this kind of a setup, where the parents pick out the boys and girls for their children. You young people that are here, how would you like that today? I remember my mom, bless her heart. She wanted to help me pick out a wife. So she discreetly would say, while I was a teenager and I was looking at girls and thinking they were uh, cuter than just long-haired boys, I figured all that out. So uh, she'd look and she'd say, oh, David, have you seen so-and-so? She's so sweet. So sweet, she was bland as mashed potatoes. <laughs> Didn't I wanted to say, Mom, that girl doesn't have any personality at all. I, I may have said that a little bit, but they were trying to pick them out. And I'm so glad I got to choose the lady that I married that I've spent the rest of my life with. So glad that our culture didn't force me to choose somebody else or my mom didn't. But uh, here's something very interesting. The betrothal period was very, very important because the contract was made and was secure. In fact, the contract, this is before they're married, similar to our engagement period, but much, much more binding. If that contract was ever broken, there had to be a divorce performed for that contract to be broken. Even though they were not married, they weren't living together, they were betrothed, they were promised to each other. It's a very, very serious situation. In fact, look in Matthew chapter 1, and I'll show you this in a very familiar story. Matthew chapter 1 refers to Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph were betrothed or a spouse, which means the same thing. And Joseph learned that Mary was going to have a baby. They would not been married yet, but they were under contract. They were betrothed or betrothed to each other. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. I'll show you how this works. Matthew 1, 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When, as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, betrothed, espoused, before they came together, that's before they were married or had that married relationship, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He was going to hide her, send her away, rather than divorce her. He didn't want her to have to go through this public shame and humiliation of divorcement. But that was the only way that contract could be broken. The betrothal period was very, very important. It was during this time that the young man was to learn a craft and begin to save up his money or whatever he would use as a dowry to give to the family. As you can imagine, this period often lasted for years. If they were young, it lasted until they were old enough of age to be married. Then at some point, the couple was ready for the second stage of this marriage. It's what I call the presentation stage. The presentation stage it was a short time. Uh, they didn't have a particular number of days for this, but those that were wealthy would have it for a little longer time. Those that were not wealthy would do shorter. Sometimes it would last a week or more. This was the time of a presentation. At the end of that presentation time, the groom and the groomsmen would go and get the bride and the bridesmaids, and they would bring them to the wedding. They would go get them, they would bring them to the wedding. Now, sometimes they would bring them and they would sort of hide them for a day or two. There's all different variations of this. But they were getting them for the wedding. They were bringing them to the wedding. And then the last stage was the wedding ceremony, which, of course, is when they would exchange vows. They would make the vows like we do or similar to that. And then after the vows were exchanged, almost as part of the marriage was the marriage feast or the marriage supper. It was a great time of celebration, 
a great meal, food and drink and happiness and all kinds of uh, joy celebrating. So that's how the marriages took place back then. Now let me show you the symbolism and how it fits in here with Revelation chapter 19, how it fits in with us. Earlier read in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 that the Jewish marriage symbolizes the relationship of the Lord with his church. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 said, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He's speaking to a church. He says, I'm going to present you as the wife, as the bride of Jesus Christ. Now, let me show you how this develops in these three stages leading up to the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper. Look, first thing, first of the betrothal period. The plan for our marriage, this marriage to, of the bride to Jesus Christ, was planned a long time ago. God's been thinking about this for a long, long time, planning this wedding for a long time. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Ephesians back, chapter 1, verse 4, we read this. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. We've been chosen by the, holy, by the heavenly Father a long time before the wedding would take place. Also, a considerable dowry has already been raised and paid. The Bible says in 1 Peter, you know what the dowry is? It's the blood of Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says this, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. The precious blood of Christ was the dowry, the payment that was due so we could become the bride of Christ, so we could be saved. This is a time of preparation. We right now are in that betrothal period. We're in that period while all the preparation is being made. Long before we knew the bridegroom, we knew the heavenly father, he knew who would accept him. He knew who would respond to him. He knew who would become the bride of Christ. Get this. Jesus, after he was here on earth, returned to heaven to make more preparation. You see, this first stage is a stage of preparation. God has already planned it. God has already raised the dowry. Now Jesus, the Bible says in John 14, in my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus said. If it were not so, I, go, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. One day, he's coming back. All the preparations will be made. We told you recently in a message about the rapture. That's what's next. That's when he comes back, when all the prep preparations are made. I've sometimes wondered about this. I mean no disrespect. But my wife is a decorator. She loves interior decorating. I wonder if, if in heaven there was just some delay. He said, wait a minute, Mrs. Purdue's house isn't quite decorated. Her mansion isn't kind, isn't, doesn't have enough pictures on the wall. I'm not sure how all that works. When the preparations are all made, he's coming back. And that betrothal stage will be over. Then comes the presentation stage. Now, we read earlier in Ephesians 5, husbands love your wives, even as Christ loved the church gave himself for it. He might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. He might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And do you see this? When do you think this takes place? I believe it begins when the bridegroom comes to get us. He comes to take his bride away. He comes to catch us up. He comes to rapture us and take us to heaven to be with him. Think about this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Just as the Jewish bridegroom during this time, just before the wedding, just before the ceremony, 
just before this all took place, he would go and he would get the bride, he would bring the bride to that wedding, bring her attendance to that wedding, bring her uh, accompaniment, bring everything, get ready for that wedding. Our Lord Jesus will come back and will catch us up, take us to heaven to be ready for that wedding. Most of you, I think, by now know that my wife has retired. I've mentioned that several times. Being retired, she's at home most of the time. But there are times when I think, you know, uh, I need her to make a visit with me. Or I'm going to go somewhere and I need her to be with me. Or sometimes I say, uh, I'd like to take her to lunch. So here's what she does every morning. She gets up and she makes the bed and does all that kind of stuff. And then she gets ready for the day. She gets dressed, and she combs her hair and fixes her hair and puts on her face and all, whatever all that she does to get ready. So, listen, so if I call and say, sweetheart, I need you to go somewhere with me, she's ready. She's re- Every day, she's ready. she's ready. Now, listen, isn't that how we ought to live as Christians? Every day, we ought to get up and be ready. He may call us. It won't be on a phone call, it won't be a cell phone, but it'll be a call, it'll be a trumpet sound, and you'll call us and say, are you ready? Time to come. Every day she gets up and she's ready. That's how we ought to live as Christians. What a joy it is. So he comes, he catches us up. We have that preparation time. He's gotten us all together. He's gotten everything prepared. It's all ready. And we're in heaven. Then comes the wedding ceremony itself. Now look with me to our text in Revelation chapter 19. took that long to get back there, but here we are, Revelation 19. As you read it earlier, you saw in the first several verses, it's a time of rejoicing. In fact, four times in those first several verses, we hear someone saying, Hallelujah, 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 shouting out and rejoicing, a great time of rejoicing. This is a time of rejoicing in heaven. The bridegroom has brought the bride. The bride is here. We're ready for the celebration, ready for the ceremony. The bride is here. It's, we might say it's happy hour in heaven. Sorry for that term. Now look at verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. Here's the reason for the rejoicing. The mar- it's time for the marriage. Time for the marriage of the Lamb. Now let me show you something different about this marriage than normal marriages that we're familiar with. Over the years, it's been my privilege to be involved in a number of weddings. Normally in a wedding, uh, as it's beginning, the pastor and the groom and perhaps some groomsmen will some way or other make, them make their way to the front of the building, whether they come down an aisle or... Uh, here often we come out of a side room and we line up here. So the, the pastor and the bridegroom and the groomsmen, we're all waiting for the bride. Who's the feature at the bride? At, at the, <laughs> okay, that away. Who's the feature at the wedding? The bride. Dun, dun, da, 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 da. Then the music starts. Da, 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 da. Okay, now, she's the feature. In fact... <laughs> I've thought about this. I've, I've never suggested it, but I've thought about it. The, when the bride, when the music starts and the bride starts coming down the aisle, every eye looks at the bride. Everybody's looking. at The bridegroom could go off and get a cup of coffee and come back. Nobody would ever miss him. I mean, that's about how it is. She's the feature at the wedding. But look at this wedding. Look at it, Revelation 19. It's called the marriage of the Lamb. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And then, in case you didn't understand, his wife hath made herself ready. To her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. But the focus is on the bridegroom, on the Lamb, on Jesus Christ. Isn't that different? Here it's on the bride, there it's on the groom. It's on the Lamb. Look what happens next. Verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. Now, after we're in heaven, that great wedding will take place. 
I don't know what kind of vows there will be. I don't know if we'll all call out. The, I don't know how all that works. You can read, and if you can figure it out, you can come tell me. I'll listen. But the fact is that ceremony will take place. But as part of that ceremony, we will then be ushered into a time of great feasting called the marriage supper of the Lamb. You ever wonder how long that'll take place? <laughs> Some of you have been to big meals where there was a, a several courses and you sat down and you had this first and then you kind of waited and you had this next and uh, then you had this next and before you ever get to the main course, you're kind of ready to go. I'm, I'm okay, I've had enough to eat now. But a, a meal like that that just has all these courses and you take the time and, and then when you're all through, you have dessert or a cup of coffee or something, big, long meal that takes hours and hours. Think about this one. Now, we've already been taken up. That's the rapture. Down on earth, they're experiencing this tribulation period, seven years of tribulation. Maybe just a little short of that, but seven years. We're in heaven. Now, I believe that very likely we'll go before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know how long that'll take. At the judgment seat of Christ, we'll be rewarded for what we have done as Christians. We'll go before that judgment seat. How long will that take? A month? Six months? Two years? Four years? I don't know. But I think most of the rest of that time will be this marriage supper. Can you imagine a supper lasting three years? I want to be there. The marriage supper of the Lamb. What a wonderful, wonderful time. Now let me show you something else about this marriage. There are some special guests invited to the marriage. Most weddings have guests. You invite people to come and be witnesses to the wedding and to enjoy the celebration. But it seems this wedding will be no exception. Look at this in verse 9 again. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called, or might say invited, unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, these are the true sayings of God. There's a special blessing, a special beatitude pronounced on those who are invited or called to this marriage supper. You say, well, doesn't that, doesn't that mean the bride? Well, let me ask you something. If a groom would send an invitation to his bride-to-be, and say, I'd like you to come to the wedding. How do you think that would be received? That's not what happens. The groom and the bride are part of the wedding. The lamb and the bride are part of the wedding. And there are some people invited. Now, uh, there's a lot of confusion here. I'm going to tell you what I think. And you can leave here and say, uh, uh, this is what pastor thinks. If he's wrong, it's his fault. Don't have, don't. I don't know all the answers. But here are the possibilities. First of all, some believe that the bride are only Baptists. How many have heard that? Only Baptists are the bride. Uh, we call them Baptist briders. They say, well, if you're a member of some other denomination, you won't be in the bride of Christ. The problem is most of us know some really good people who are saved and love the Lord and serve the Lord faithfully who are not Baptists. Now, they ought to be ashamed. They ought to be Baptists, but they're not Baptists. <laughs> Uh, the fact is, I don't believe that only Baptists will be the bride of Christ. And if you believe that, you're welcome to believe that, but I don't believe it. Here's what I believe. I believe that the bride, well, in Hebrews chapter 12, the bride is called the church of the firstborn. Church of the firstborn. What's church mean? Church is assembly. Right now, we assemble together in local churches. But when that bride is caught up, when we're raptured together, that'll be the first time that church ever assembles. That'll be the church of the firstborn. That'll be everybody that's saved, everybody that's here, everybody that's died that's saved. They're caught up. So I believe that the bride will include all of those who were saved from the time Christ died and rose again all the way to the time he catches us home. That'll be the bride. You say, well, what about those people in the Old Testament? Well, they weren't ever saved. They were, they were looking for Jesus Christ. They weren't saved like we were, and they weren't part of a church. 
Well, they talked about the church in the wilderness. That was the assembly in the wilderness. So they very likely, or at least possibly, are the ones invited. They'll be in heaven. So we're the bride, and they get to come and be a part of it. They get to celebrate with us. There's another group of people. I believe that those during the tribulation period, if they've heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, before the tribulation period, their eyes will be blinded, their minds will be blinded, but there will be many saved. We, we talked last week about 144,000 witnesses and people all over the world being saved. Some of them will be martyred. Some of them during the tribulation period will be coming to heaven. I believe they'll be guests because they too were not part of the church. So I believe those that are called or invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb are these saints who have been saved since Jesus died and until the rapture. Now, you can have any other, but that's the bride. Now we're the bride. We're having a wedding, <laughs> the marriage of the Lamb. Now let me finish with this thought, because that's controversial, and you can disagree, and you can go out mumbling if you want to. But let me talk about the sweetness of the marriage. Most couples, after they get married, go away for a honeymoon. My wife and I went away for a honeymoon, and you know you're young, you don't know very much. At our wedding, some people gave us some money. I thought about this years later. Had they not given us money, we'd have gone on our honeymoon, probably couldn't afford to come back home. That was just a blessing. We had a honeymoon, and it was far too short. We spent a few days in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, and we had a wonderful time, came back home and so forth. Now consider our wedding as the bride of Christ. You say, will there be a honeymoon? I think there will be. Listen to this. After this marriage supper, after this great feast, there's going to be a, a thousand years with Jesus Christ called the millennium a time when he rules and reigns in peace and we can enjoy the fellowship and the intimacy with our Lord Jesus Christ for a thousand-year honeymoon. Isn't that exciting? Well, I'm excited about it, whether you are or not. I believe that'll be the honeymoon. Debbie and I celebrated just a couple weeks ago our 53rd wedding anniversary, 53. She was only seven. I want you to do the math, get it right. It's amazing how quickly time goes when you're having fun. We talked just this week about how quickly time has seemed to go, and she was marveling over just, I can hardly believe it's already the end of August and these things and that thing. When we were engaged, I had purchased a ring, and we, we were not together. I lived, I was finishing college, and she was already back home, and while we were getting ready, I would write her every day, and she was saving money and preparing all the stuff for the wedding. We could hardly wait for the wedding day. That's where we are today. We can hardly, I can hardly wait for that wedding day. I can hardly wait for our bridegroom to come and catch us home and take us to be with him and have that wonderful celebration, the marriage of the Lamb and the marriage supper of the Lamb. There may be people here that are not saved. If you're not saved, if he comes, you'll miss out. All this joy, all this celebration, you'll miss it. He wants you to be saved. He's paid the dowry for your salvation. But you must be willing to trust him for salvation. I was visiting, my wife and I were visiting with a couple this week, and the man had a rich religious background, but he said, I'm not sure about being saved. He's done this, and he's done this, and he prayed and asked the Lord to save him. That's it. He believed, he asked the Lord to save him. He's saved. That's what you can do if you're not saved. You can ask Christ to save you today. Let me say this, if you're saved, listen, if you're saved, he'll never break up with you. Sometimes people are engaged, and they have a breakup, and let me just say, it's better to break up before you're getting married than after, all that. But listen, he won't ever break up. He won't break that contract. When he became engaged, we became betrothed. When we became his, when we committed ourselves to him, he said, this is forever. This is everlasting. He'll not break his promise. Now, one day he's coming back. 
One day he's going to take us home. You have your makeup on? Have your hair combed? Are you ready? Let's be ready because he might come back today. Would you bow your heads, please? What a blessing it is to see these pictures in the Bible. At a marriage supper, a great celebration. What a joy that is. I don't know how we'll celebrate in heaven. I, I just don't know that. How many times can we shout hallelujah? I don't know. How many times do we want to look at the king? How many times do we want to look at Jesus Christ? How much time do we want to spend with our family celebrating and, and reminiscing if that's what we do? But I know this. It'll be a celebration like we've never had here on earth. It'll be a marriage like we've never attended here on earth. That marriage supper will be something like we've never experienced on earth. We have a little picture here with a wedding and a picture here with the marriage feast, but nothing like the real thing. If you're here this morning and you've not accepted Christ as your Savior yet, I encourage you today, accept him as your Savior. If you need help, if you slip down to the front, we'll have someone take a Bible and show you so you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. You can know for sure that when he comes, you're part of that crowd. You're part of that bride. I'd encourage that today. And if you're here and you are saved and you say, well, I'm saved, but I, I really haven't been living like that. Let's get busy today. Let's live understanding he could come back today. Let's be ready. I'm going to ask you please to stand if you're able. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for how my heart was thrilled with the thought of this great marriage of the Lamb and the great marriage feast, marriage supper that will follow. And I've tried to convey that joy and that celebration, that excitement to these people I pray that you would touch their hearts with this and help them to realize what we have ahead of us is so great that no matter of sacrifice, suffering, or problems here are worthy to be compared with what you've in store for us. And I pray, Father, if there are young people or men or women who are here and not saved yet, they'd come today and settle that in their hearts and lives. We'll show them from your word. If there are those who are saved and need to make other decisions, that they'll come today and make those decisions today so they'll be completely ready when you come. Bless this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. I'm going to ask you to stay with your heads bowed in an attitude of prayer. We're going to sing a familiar invitation song, Just As I Am. If you want to look at the songbook, it's number 232. Just as I am, I come. I want you to come just as you are and get things settled with the Lord. As the music begins, would you come today? Would you come? Would you come today? The song says, just as I am, I come. Just as you know the song, sing it along. With Brother Long Others that will come today. If you have a decision you need to make, this is the day. Let's make that decision. Waiting not. While these are here at the altar, would you can Continue to sing. God's touched your heart. This is the time. Just as I am the tossed about With many a conflict, many a doubt I 
this way please everyone look this way for a moment we've been singing an invitation we're inviting you to come just as you are but if you have any kind of a decision to make this is the time our invitation is going to close in a moment God's invitation doesn't close if you want to speak to someone after church you're welcome to do so but I encourage you don't put the decision off let's go back and sing that first verse it's number 232 if you don't know the words first verse we'll slow it down a little bit this is the last verse, if no one comes. Come just as you are. Would you come? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and Thank you so much. I'm so glad you've been here today. You've encouraged me by being here today. And I trust you'll come back tonight to hear our missionary. Um, apparently, I slipped up by mentioning a, a country. Going to Southeast Asia, please help me with that. But come back tonight. Now, uh, we are receiving a love offering tonight, but we have uh, in the back an opportunity for you to give a love offering if you may not be here this evening or can't get back. We want to give this love offering to our missionary, help him get started. He's been eight months, I think, on deputation, raising support, so he needs support to get from place to place. And then uh, we'll take him on, Lord willing, as one of our missionaries, part of our missionary family. In fact, tonight I'll be asking for those who would like to become his prayer partner. We have prayer partners for every one of our missionaries. If we can, we'll do that tonight. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock. Now, offering plates are at the doors. And I think by now the missionaries will be out there, and they do have coffee candy and cappuccino candy. Just saying. you got to come back tonight. Father, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for the joy we have of serving you. We ask you to bless us as we go our various ways. Bring us back tonight, Father, for a great celebration as we uh, hear the challenge from our missionary, if we hear the plans he has, we hear his background and how you have uniquely prepared him and Sadie for this ministry. We pray that you'll bless them. Bless us, dismiss us, please, with your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.